the KLH Model 5 versus the Wharfdale Linton. It is a battle to the finish of your wallet. Which one are you going to buy? Let's talk about the pros and cons of each and which one I prefer in this video. In this video, I'm going to be talking to you about what I heard, what I liked, what I did not like about each of these speakers, and I'm going to be providing you some data that backs up my rationale for that. I'm not going to deep dive into the overall performance of each of these speakers because I've done that separately in their own videos. If you're interested in seeing those individual reviews, please see the link in the description below. The KLH comes with a few different settings, and in my previous video, I discussed all of those settings in depth. What I wound up landing on in my listening was the low setting and sometimes the medium setting with the grill on and the speakers not firing directly at me, but towed out about 10 degrees. With the Wharfdale, it does not come with different settings. So you can adjust the mid to high frequency balance on its own. It's just one setting, the default setting as it's shipped to you, plug the wires in, that's it. There is no individual settings. Let's talk about some things that are basically the same between the two models. The Wharfdale and the KLH speakers both have a very wide radiation pattern, which means they're going to send a lot of information out into the room. You may or may not like that. I would say that if you don't like a wide radiating speaker, then either of these are not for you. You might as well just stop watching this video right now. You're probably more a fan of, I would say, like the horn type designs where they have a more constricted waveguide. They focus the sound into the room at the desired listening position without having a lot of spray that goes off onto the walls. However, if you do like a wider radiation pattern like I do, then these are really two interesting speakers. I will say that due to the wide radiation of both speakers, you're going to give up some imaging placement. I mean, that's just the nature of the beast. But that's a trade-off that I'm willing to take. The base extension for both speakers is about the same. And in fact, their F3 and their F10 are pretty much the exact same. The F10, I think on both of these is only three Hertz apart. And the F3 is pretty much the exact same value. But it's worth noting that with the KLH, I felt like there needed to be more mid bass. And the reason for that is the KLH has a baffle step compensation built into it where it kind of drops off in the upper mid bass to lower mid range transition area by about two to 300 Hertz. And in doing so, you lose some mid bass punch, you lose some deep male vocals, you lose some upper female vocals as well. The flip side of this though, is that the KLH speakers are designed to be close to a wall. And in my listening, I could not do that. So really, by default, I would almost say that the Wharfdale are better suited for me pretty much no matter what, because I need to put the speakers out about three feet into the room. That's just by nature of my room. If you are looking for a design or you have the capability to put the speaker close to the wall and KLH recommends six to 24 inches, then the KLH may be an option for you. Now, allow me to talk about what I heard with the KLH. And again, this is going to be kind of brief. I was missing that mid bass punch, which I know was due to not being placed near a wall. With the KLH, I set the mode to low. That brought the mid bass level relative to the mid range up, and it kind of fixed that for the most part. And when I did that, the sound was more neutral. But there were a couple areas that stood out to me in my listening. There was a resonance in the mid range area, and in my notes, I had put down that it sounded like it was around 800 hertz. And looking at my data, I realized that there is a resonance around 900 Hertz and it crept in from time to time. And it tended to make things sound a little bit more boxy, a little bit more nasally from song to song. And it varied. Another thing about the KLH that I noticed on the negative side of things was that higher output volumes, which I would say is about 85 to 90 dB at four meters. There was a harshness to the two to four kilohertz region. So attack, dynamics, guitars, strings, those things 
tended to sound like they would jump out at you at higher output volume. And at lower output volume, it wasn't an issue. I attributed this to possibly some harmonic distortion, but it's hard for me to say for sure that's what it was. I'm just relating to you what I had heard. There is a decrease in the high frequency, which may come off as sounding warm. And this characteristic also shows up in the Wharfdale, but much less so. And for that reason, I would define the Wharfdale as being a more neutral sounding speaker. Yes, I would describe it as being more neutral. And the only thing that I noticed about the Wharfdale that I felt was lacking was I wrote in my notes that there was something around one to two kilohertz that just didn't sound like it had the attack that I was looking for especially noticeable on snares. So when the snare would hit, you know, I expect a little bit of a blink on some songs that are high in dynamic range. I didn't really get that from the Wharfdales. They were a little bit more forgiving in that regard. In the data, I see that there's a dip around one kilohertz, which explains what I heard. And speaking of data, let's just go ahead and jump straight into that. All of the data that we're about to talk about was captured using my Clipple near field scanner. This is a state of the art measurement device that allows you to get anechoic data in a non-anechoic room. And I know some people may be apprehensive about data. Allow me one quick second to get you to understand why data is important. Most of the time when you said, I heard this thing, but the data shows it to be a good speaker or flip-flop, usually what you're referencing is data that is completely incomplete. There's only one axis of measurement and usually that's on axis response only, or maybe it's somebody's in-room measurement. Neither of those measurements are useful on their own. And what you really need is the sound profile of the speaker around the entire speaker because reflections come from walls. That comes from the sound that's radiated to the sides, above and below, and even behind the speaker. All of these things matter. So if you only have one on-axis measurement, then you're only getting just a very small glimpse of what that speaker is gonna do in a room. So that's why we use a graphic such as this to help us characterize the performance overall. And so what I've done is I've made some notes. The sensitivity for this speaker is about 85 dB. There is this baffle step issue around 200 Hertz. And this is where I had the issue in my room. Now, again, if these speakers were placed close to a wall, this would smooth out some more. But in the setting that I use them in, which is the low, this area is smoothed out a little bit more to where it's more neutral. Going to the higher frequencies, you can see that there's a lot of nonlinearity. And some of this is caused by the grill, but most of this is caused by the diffraction effect of the lip of the speaker going all the way around. Well, the Wharfdale speaker has that same lip going around it, but the Wharfdale speaker was designed to be listened to with the grill on, and therefore it attenuates, mitigates some of those issues. And therefore the Wharfdale is the better measuring speaker. We'll talk about that in a second. Overall linearity is poor, yes, on axis. But when you start talking about the off axis sound, some of these peaks and dips start to smooth out. Now let's talk about the Wharfdale Linton results in the same manner. So the same characterization went into this. You see, also, it has pretty much the same sensitivity of about 85 dB. And I didn't really draw any boxes around the speaker because it's pretty neutral. I mean, the mid bass to mid range region is pretty neutral. There is a dip through here, but it's about one, maybe a half a dB, so it's not much. There's an increase in the on axis response, but that's also why I found that listening to them slightly off axis seemed to work better. Now, what we have here is a culmination of the direct sound, so the on axis sound, and the reflections in the room. This is all taken from the anechoic data, averaged up, and then provided you with an estimation of the in-room response. Now, I've been measuring speakers for over two years now. I'm well over 100 speakers measured. I'd say for about half of them, I've actually measured the in-room response with the RTA, and pretty much what I found is the estimation is spot on. It's within about a dB or two, above about five to 600 hertz, give or take. And that also is due more to the influence of the room because of base modes and things like that. But above 1K, you can pretty much trust the estimation blindly, almost, unless your room is just really, really different. And therefore, this is a great way to get an idea of the timbre of the speaker. I'm not talking about soundstage. I'm just talking about the overall timbre, the tonality of the speaker. I've drawn a couple boxes in and we're gonna highlight the same things that I mentioned earlier. 
Number one is that the mid bass is going to be a little bit less in output. And number two is that the speaker might sound a little bit warm. Both of these things are things that I noticed in the room before I even had an idea of what the measurements look like. I, I hadn't put them on the clipple yet. I had no idea what the measurements were going to look like. The number one thing I noticed was this region right in here. I didn't so much have an issue or notice the warmth of the speaker. I would say that I would still prefer a speaker that is a little bit more flat through this region, at least following this trend line, but I didn't really have a problem with it being subdued. Now we're gonna look at the Wharfdale's response. If I draw a trend line through here, you can see that the Wharfdale looks actually pretty good other than, like I said earlier, there's this one kilohertz dip that's gonna take away some of the attack of a snare, things like that. And then there is a drop above roughly, I'm gonna say maybe 12 kilohertz. So it's not as distinct as the drop in high frequency that the KLH has, but it is there nonetheless. I would not call the speaker warm. I would call the speaker closer to neutral. And the only thing I wish that I could fix is this particular area. But given everything else that I feel like it does right, I'm okay with leaving that. And if I wanted to, I could equalize that up a little bit and fix that or just deal with it and move on. Some people may not share the same opinion though. And if we go back to the KLH, we can see that it doesn't have that dip through here. So that may be something that you think, hey man, I'd rather have that and maybe deal with a little bit more warmth. Even though you may not care for warmth in your speaker, you're willing to accept those trade-offs or hey, maybe this defines the perfect speaker for you. I, I don't know. But that's why this data is very, very useful. Now we're gonna talk about the radiation pattern. And what we have here is a bird's eye view of the horizontal radiation of the speaker. So if you're looking from top down on top of the speaker, the zero degree line is the tweeter line. And this is 200 Hertz to 20 kilohertz going all the way out in steps. What I've drawn is a trend line of the radiation. And you can see that the speaker is about plus or minus 70 degrees. And then when you get to about, what is this? Five, eight kilohertz or so, you start decreasing in radiation in the high frequency. Now, if we look at the Wharfdale, you can see that it's roughly the same in terms of radiation width. It does seem a little bit different. Let me toggle back and forth here. It seems like the Wharfdale extends a little bit further in high frequency in terms of the radiation. And this actually is what drives the estimated in-room response and the high frequencies being more extended. Remember I talked about the KLH sounded kind of warm or it might sound kind of warm to you in your room based off that estimation. Well, that estimation is factoring in the reflections that are gonna come from the high frequencies. And since there's not so much high frequency output at the further angles for the KLH, there's less reinforcement at those high frequencies hitting the wall and coming back to you. That's why there's a drop in the KLH that isn't here in the Wharfdale. So here what we have is a compression result for the KLH speaker. And basically what you want is a flat line at zero dB. I'm comparing output at 76 dB to 86 dB, 96 dB, and 102 dB. Those are represented by these colors that you see up here. So an ideal world with a speaker with has zero compression, you would have a flat red line, you would have a flat blue and a flat purple line all through here because that speaker has zero compression from low to high volume. Unfortunately, in the real world, that doesn't often happen. And what we have here is a speaker that exhibits a pretty good bit of compression at higher volumes, but mainly in the high frequencies, not so much in the low frequencies, about half a dB or so, and then a little bit more as you go below that, but it's not a big deal in the grand scheme of things for me. On the flip side though, the Wharfdale shows compression at the low end in a significant way. It also shows compression on the high frequency end, but yeah, the low end just really stands out. This is a KLH multi-tone distortion test. Multi-tone distortion is testing the speaker with, basically it's like pink noise and it's done to emulate real music rather than just one tone at a time, it's multiple tones at a time. Being below 30 dB is typical good place to be. I'll just put it that way. In my listening, it's usually when you get above 30 dB and you start creeping up to 20 and 10, that's when you really start to notice the distortion setting in and re really creating like a grainy sound. That's really hard to describe, but if you do watch the video that I have on this topic, you'll hear exactly what I'm talking about. Click the link up here. 
go follow that video when you get some time. Moving on to the Wharfdale, we can see that the Wharfdale exhibits some distortion that goes above 3% around five to 700 Hertz. I didn't notice this in my listening. If I had the ability to go back to back instantaneously between these two speakers playing at the same output levels, I might notice it. But on their own, it's not like it was anything that I noticed. To wrap things up, let's start with the easy first. Both speakers are very wide in radiation. So if you like a wide soundstage, both of these speakers are gonna be for you. If you like tight, super precise imaging, neither of these speakers are for you. They just, you, you're not gonna get that no matter how you aim them. You're gonna trade off the imaging precision a little bit. So you may gain a little bit, but it's not gonna be anything like you would get with a very narrow dispersion, say a waveguide type design. You're just not gonna get that from either of these speakers. In terms of neutrality, well, the Wharfdale gets the win there for me. But if you're not sure of your room, or let's say you have the need to put a speaker close to a wall, well, the KLH wins out because the KLH is designed to be placed near a wall and the Wharfdale simply isn't. Personally speaking, I would order the Wharfdale and, and honest to goodness, I've considered it even though the last thing I need is a pair of speakers in my living room. Straight up, I've considered ordering the Wharfdale for my own self because I like them that much. I'm just I'm trying to resist that urge. If you are interested in either of these and you're not sure which one to get, order both. There's a lot of retailers out there that will allow you to buy and try in your home. And I will drop an affiliate link below if you're interested in ordering either of these speakers from Crutchfield or maybe even Amazon. You clicking that link helps me out. Me telling you or suggesting that you click that link doesn't change the data and it doesn't change what I hear. It's just a way for me to help keep all this stuff going. All these lights, this microphone, buying speakers to test and review. That's how I do it. It's through affiliate links, it's through PayPal donations, and it's through Patreon support. And, and my patrons, thank you all for your continued support. And I really do appreciate that. But yeah, I know some people are really affiliate link adverse. And as soon as you say affiliate, they go, oh my God, you're the devil. Like, okay, I was that person once. And then I started trying to run a YouTube channel and I started trying to buy stuff to review on my own and then selling it at a big loss. That didn't last long. Let me tell you, my, uh, my self-righteousness faded pretty quickly. Now, the cool thing is, like I said, I've got data. I've got data for days. So you can look straight to that data and you can ignore everything I said about the speaker and you can trust the data. And then you can say, okay, well, since Aaron's done all this freaking work, I'll throw him a bone by ordering through an affiliate link and you don't have to take my word for it. You make your own decision. That's the glory. That's the beautiful thing about having the data. But yeah, that's a great way to help support me and help me keep doing this thing. And just know that it's truly appreciated if you decide to go that route. With all of that said, I am done in this video. I hope you learned something. I hope you appreciate it. And again, I do suggest if you haven't already to go back and watch either of these separate reviews because I do have more in-depth detail, but I really just wanted to hit the highlights for those of you who are curious about how these two speakers compare against each other. I prefer the Wharfdale. You may prefer the KLH. At the end of the day, get what you like. Don't let anybody else tell you that you're dumb for liking what you like, but do take the opportunity to learn when you can. And hopefully I'm presenting you with enough information to help you make a smarter purchase decision. Yeah. All right. You all take care. I'll talk to you later. Peace.